Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Information Literacy in Context, Expanding Foundational Skills Instruction into the Disciplines, which is sponsored by Credo. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for Im uh, <clears throat> interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't see the chat panel, you can click the button that's trying hard to look like a dialogue cloud um, on the bottom of your screen um, to open that up. <clears throat> and let's see. You can also use uh, the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speakers. That should be open for you. Um, at the end of the presentation, they'll take a few minutes to answer your questions, so do send those in throughout. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, that's what the chat panel's for. Um, you can let me know there, and I will troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right, our speakers today are Jonna Peterson and Amanda DeFederici, and with that, we are ready to get started, so I will turn the floor over to them. Okay, great. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is Jonna. I'm the Senior Clinical Informationist at the Galter Health Sciences Library at Northwestern University in Chicago. And hi, everyone. This is Amanda DeFederici. I'm an Instructional Librarian and Product Manager with Credo Reference. And I also wanted to give a quick shout out to um, Annie Westcott, who um, is uh, contributed to this presentation, but wasn't here today uh, to chime in. So I'll be uh, adding some points from her perspective. She is a research librarian also at the Galter Health Sciences Library at Northwestern University. So today's session uh, with uh, information literacy in the disciplines, specifically health science, uh, we wanted to um, cover a few things today for you to talk about what information literacy looks like in the health sciences specifically and how you can apply knowledge from that clinical setting into the classroom for teaching information literacy at many different levels. Um, whether you're working with medical students or maybe you're working with um, undergraduates who aspire to be doctors or nurses or um, therapists or uh, many other different professions in the health sciences. And we hope that through this presentation, um, this is going to help make the health sciences a little less intimidating uh, for those of you who are new to the area. Um, myself, before coming to Credo, I was a librarian. Um, my very first job out of library school actually was cataloging a nursing collection. And I um, went on to support them through information literacy instruction and also build a pharmacy um, program with our library. And, uh, it was very intimidating at the beginning, and I did not have a background, but uh, I leaned on a lot of colleagues who did have expertise um, similar to Jana and learned a lot, and hopefully this presentation will give you some uh, confidence in moving forward with that. And lastly, we'll talk a bit about uh, how these experiences um, uh, influence the design of Credo's newest um, offering, Instruct Health Science. So we'd like to start with a poll about uh, just learning a little bit more about you today and what is your role or experience with the health sciences and information literacy and feel free to um, select all that apply to you. We'll give it just a few seconds for people to put in their responses. Okay, um, Mark, I think we could uh, yeah, close out the poll. Let's um, take a look at those results. You should be seeing them in your um, 
the panel here. All right, um, okay, there we go. All right, so a lot of reference and instruction um, librarians uh, with us today, that's awesome. And, and a fair number also who don't work with health science, but maybe you're curious about learning more, so that's fantastic. Um, and a small, uh, smaller percentage of you are um, actually liaisons to uh, clinical departments, so um, that's awesome. You're gonna, uh, I think, relate to a lot of what Jonna has to share with us. Um, one more quick poll, just to gauge your level of confidence. How confident are you with teaching students about uh, health science related resources and also information literacy concepts? I'm curious to know the answers for this one. <laughs> All right. We're just waiting for our results to come in. So a fair number of you are pretty confident, feeling good or, um, or know a little bit, ready to learn more. So that's fantastic. Well, at this point then, I'm going to turn this over to Jonna to share um, a little bit about her background and what it's like working uh, in very deep in the health sciences. So Jonna, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, so my normal day-to-day -day work is kind of um, a blend. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm working at the Galter Health Sciences Library at Northwestern University um, in Chicago. So we are a, a separate entity from uh, the hospital on our campus. So Northwestern University, um, Northwestern University, which is based in Evanston, Chicago, or Evanston, which is north of Chicago, is what I intended to say. And then the medical school and the hospital are actually located in the city, so a little bit further south. The hospital, which is also present on our campus, is um, the place where all of the students, faculty, staff that are appointed at the Feinberg School of Medicine, where I um, is the medical school for Northwestern. So they are all doing their clinical portion of their work in the hospital on our campus. So um, the university itself does not own a hospital. I guess that's what I wanted to make clear by saying all that. Uh, my day-to-day -day work is with the folks that are working in the Feinberg School of Medicine. So it is typically a blend of projects. Um, we do a whole lot of stuff um, how did I get into working as a clinical informationist? Let me start with that. Um, I was an undergraduate science major. Uh, I didn't really have an intent to go to library school when I, when I came out of science uh, with my undergraduate degree. I actually worked in an immunology research lab for about five years while I was going to library school. Um, once I graduated, I figured that the best blend of the work I had already done and the work that I wanted to do in the future was probably a health sciences library um, or a science library. Um, but that, saying that, my first job was actually in a public library. I did that for about a year and then eventually transitioned to a solo hospital library and then moved over to an academic health sciences library in Chicago um, where I was for about 10 years and then eventually came to Northwestern. So my um, experience, my training sort of all led me to the position that I have now, but um, I don't want to give the impression that this was a plan. <laughs> it's sort of where it's just sort of happened this way. Um, so what is working in a health sciences library like? So it's very similar to working, um, you know, in I would imagine any type of library. So it's a blend of, in our case, research projects, teaching, reference duties, departmental projects, committee work. Um, I'm the head of our um, reference interest group. So that's a monthly meeting that we have where we talk about um, resources or topics that are of interest to those in the public services 
domain of our library. Um, I do systematic reviews. We all at our library are all responsible for teaching monthly workshops. So I teach PubMed workshops, I teach EndNote workshops, Scopus, um, a few other resources. And we do those uh, workshops by um, on a monthly schedule, but we also will do them by appointment and do them one-on-one. -on -one. I do a lot of consultation work. So one-on-one -on -one meetings with students, faculty, staff, anybody who might be embarking upon a project. Um, the day-to-day -day work, uh, so, what I would say is that next part is the day-to-day -day work in the clinical informationist role. Um, so as a clinical informationist, um, I, my role is not typical. Um, we spend three mornings a week uh, in our hospital rounding with teams from the Department of Medicine. So for those that are not exactly familiar with how the Department of Medicine is broken up. Um, it is a large department that encompasses a lot of divisions. Um, so at our hospital, physicians that are in the Department of Medicine are also doctors that are in allergy and immunology, cardiology, endocrinology, um, gastroenterology and hepatology, geriatrics, hematology and oncology, um, a division called hospital medicine, infectious disease, nephrology, pulmonary and critical care medicine and rheumatology. So those are all departments or divisions of the Department of Medicine. So when I work with staff from the Department of Medicine, I could be working with anybody from medicine, traditional internal medicine doctors, or anybody from one of those divisions that I just mentioned. Um, in terms of the types of people that we work with, so they were, we work with physicians. So, and those are physicians at all levels. So attendings, the more senior physician, um, residents and fellows, so those are folks obviously still in their training. Uh, nurses, so th that includes floor nurses, advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, pharmacists, obviously medical students because we have a medical school on our campus, social workers, occupational therapy, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, and I'm sure there's somebody that I'm forgetting. Um, so those are our typical patron group and those are the people that my intent um, that's who I serve when I'm working with the Department of Medicine. So I will say medicine, but it actually includes many, many, many different types of people. So um, let's maybe go to the next slide, Amanda. All right, so I am also a liaison. Our library, like many libraries and academics, um, work in liaison areas. So I am one of the liaisons also to the Department of Medicine. Um, we, work in, in teams, um, teams are super important in medicine. So that is probably the most important thing that I can like get across. Um, a typical team is made up of an attending or the senior physician, the residents, the medical students, myself as the clinical informationist, um, a cl sometimes a clinical documentation nurse, a pharmacist, and sometimes the bedside nurse or the nurse that's responsible for caring for the patient. Um, that team could also include drop-ins by occupational therapy, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, social work, or anybody else that might need to um, work out or work with the patient. Um, so the interesting thing is medicine is one of the rotations that medical students typically work um, once they become a third year students. So for those that aren't familiar with the structure of medical school, usually the first um, two years are spent working on book topics, so the classroom-based learning. And then they're traditionally the very tail end of their second year and then their third and fourth years are spent doing rotations. So the medical students um, are also a part of those, those teams that we're actually working with. Um, so that said, those teams, for anybody that's ever been hospitalized in an academic medical center, you know that there are a lot of people that come in and out of your room at all different times of the day. And um, so those groups of people, so the Department of Medicine is made up of the groups or the people that I have just mentioned. So I would be added to one of those people that actually comes into your room with the Department of Medicine to hear about your case or to examine you. Obviously, I do not do the examining. I'm not a clinician, but I, I'm nearby when the physicians are doing their exams. Um, occasionally, when we visit teams in the hospital, we will also do something called bedside rounds. Um, so normally, 
uh, a normal day uh, with rounds, the patient's information is essentially presented in the hallway outside the patient's room. Then we proceed into the patient's room, examine the patient, and then we come back out and discuss anything that happened in the room. Sometimes they opt for bedside rounds, and bedside rounds happens actually in the room. So all of the, the three steps that I just mentioned happen in the room in front of the patient. So there are some physicians that actually like to handle it that way um, as well. So what are some of the challenges that um, we face, you know, as as a part of being a part of this process? So there's obviously different levels of information literacy in patrons um, or in the you know, are the participants. When I'm, when I'm saying patrons, I'm typically meaning the medical students, the residents, the fellows, anybody that would be affiliated with the university or the Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, one of the biggest things that we have is access issues. So depending on your status at our hospital, um, you may or may not be entitled to access all of the resources that Feinberg has available. Um, and that has to do with obviously licensing and the fact that the university and the hospital are two separate corporate entities. So um, our faculty, staff, and students typically have access to the things that Feinberg provides, but then sometimes OT, PT, respiratory therapy, and some of the floor nurses do not based on the status. So sometimes navigating those types of things can be a little bit challenging. Uh, let's head on to the next slide. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit about some of the differences that we see. So our um, process for training with students, medical students in the Department of Medicine, is a little different. Um, so typically our medical students are the lead person caring for the patient. So a medical student is assigned one or two patients from the roster of patients that a particular team has, and then that student is responsible for the care of that patient. Um, it is obviously up to be corrected or adjusted by the resident or attending or more senior physician, if necessary, but they really try to let the student do the presenting, let the student answer the patient's questions, let the student lead the exam, and, and really try um, to get them immersed in, you know, bedside medicine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they've spent essentially the first two years of medical school doing problem-based learning and didactics in a classroom. Um, so this is the third year of medicine is, of medical school is actual, the first time that they have actual patient care related responsibilities. Um, so the hierarchy of evidence for studies related to treatment um, is displayed on this slide. So we actually um, receive clinical questions from our team. So, so when my colleague and I go on rounds with the Department of Medicine, we're, we're, we're listening essentially at the bedside for questions that the teams generate in the care of their patients. And our work that we we do, we provide that information or those answers to those clinical questions back to the team. It usually comes back to them in email. But when we try to answer the questions, we typically try to use the highest level of evidence available to answer that question. Now, um, you can see that there's seven levels of evidence on the slide here that you're taking and looking at. Um, what, we, what we typically do with these is, so, it would be an ideal situation if to answer someone's clinical question, everyone had a systematic review of randomized control trials, right? That would be an ideal situation, but that isn't the ideal. That isn't the situation that you actually find yourself in. So what we do is we try to answer the question with the highest level of evidence that's available for this, the question that we're asked, okay? So sometimes that's maybe an observational cohort study, and without going a lot into study design, um, the higher you go on this pyramid, the more rigorous the design of the study um, is. And in theory, I don't want to say better, but the more reliable the information that is generated by that study could be. So uh, we try to answer with the most, um, the highest level of evidence that we can when we're providing results back to our actual team. So 
in, in theory, so how are these resources used in the clinical setting? So, so they may not have time, our, our participants will not have time for an exhaustive review of the literature in order to proceed with a treatment plan for their patient. Um, so we truly try to tail the, tailor the searching that we're doing to the specific needs and to the questions that we're being asked. Um, so for those that are familiar with PubMed, um, if you're familiar with PubMed clinical queries, that's one of the tools that has sort of pre-designed search hedges in it, search filters that would help weed out the non-clinical or irrelevant citations. Um, we also, you know, try to choose resources, high quality, and it's sometimes we just have to think about what our users are going to have time to actually review. So the fact that I could find 25 or 50 studies to actually answer their question in a clinical scenario is not necessarily the most helpful. We want to try to narrow down the results that we find to that highest level of evidence available, and then that's what we actually pass on to our um, users. Um, and this is Amanda just jumping in here. Um, you know, when you're looking at this hierarchy of evidence, um, you know, it also has some applications in, in academia, um, in the, the, the side of working with students more um, you know, in a more traditional way in a library. Um, uh, in Annie's role as a research librarian, you know, she's seeing those students, um, you know, at the reference desk or in research consultations or things. And, and the, the type of, um, you know, it's a different situation there where she has more time to work to do those sort of comprehensive or exhaustive studies, uh, searches that looking for uh, systematic reviews, uh, which is preferable. Um, and in many cases, you know, if, uh, if a systematic review is not available for something, then they can use something like a case study or a cohort study, just with a caveat that this is the highest level of evidence that they could find because a systematic re review wasn't available. Um, so there's, uh, you know, a, a different context for when those students are coming, uh, a different student, the context that the students are coming from in the type of information they're looking for to meet their needs. And it really seems to boil down to just they have much more time when they're doing a research project uh, versus the, the clinical environment, obviously. Um, we also yeah. see uh, some differences in the, the types of questions and, and how they're receiving this. So, John, I'll let you speak to the clinical side. Yeah. yeah. So, our, our clinical information as service, um, you know, we sort of pride ourselves on, on the speed at which we can find accurate information in the same day and return you know, we return a package of information back to the teams we work with. So um, that information is often used, you know, uh, delivered back to the team and is instrumental in developing a treatment plan um, or planning a treatment, you know, for, for a particular patient. Um, so just because I haven't actually talked about how the questions come in, so when we're, our patients, when we're on rounds with the Department of Medicine teams, we're actually listening to those case presentations. And, and in the process of the case presentations, questions inevitably come up. And these are questions that are sort of posed to the team. They could be from the student, from the attending, from the resident. And we're sort of listening. Sometimes those questions are answered by another member of the team. But other times, those questions sort of go out into the ether. And, and we're sort of listening to those questions for the ones that go out into the ether that need to be answered but the team doesn't answer them immediately or doesn't have time or has to look into it, those are the types of things that we're pulling and coming back and actually following up with the team on. So we listen for those questions and then my colleague and I typically go back to our offices in the afternoon um, after rounds is over and we actually get, get a start on answering those questions. And so as you can see kind of on the slide, they, they come back, um, kind of in, I guess I could say three flavors, you know, kind of point of care, um, point of care, this background literature and this comprehensive kind of search. Um, so probably the main two that I'm answering when, when I'm on rounds is going to be the point of care and the background literature. Um, you know, so we, we get asked very specific questions, like they're very pointed and they're very uh, direct. So. For example, you know, they can ask you, how many times does drug X, uh, you know, cause a specific side effect? Um, or I went, I actually went through my database of questions this morning and pulled out a few others. So, um, 
and these are going to maybe sound a little more complicated, but anyway, the, the, these, are the, these are good examples of the types of things we get asked. So um, we had a patient with um, pancre suspected pancreatitis, and the question was, um, so they were going to put the patient on fluids, and the question was, should they use normal saline, like a normal saline drip, or should they use a type of fluid called lactated ringers to give to the patient with pancreatitis? And the answer is lactated ringers. But it has to do with the reason, um, the amount, or the the types of, in, or the 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 contents of what's in lactated ringers versus normal saline, and for there's a reason that you give that to a patient with pancreatitis, right? So the the answer was why? Why do you use lactated ringers uh, versus normal saline? So that was the type of thing that the the team was really interested in. Like they knew the answer was lactated ringers, but they didn't know why the answer was lactated ringers. Um, Another one was we were looking, um, this was this one just happened on Monday of this week, where uh, we had a team that was going to be giving a um, patient IV vitamin K, and uh, the, the attending physician mentioned that he had had a patient that had had an anaphylactic reaction to IV vitamin K. And the question became, well, what was the mechanism of that reaction? Is that something we should be worried about in our current patient that we were going to treat on Monday? Um, so... The questions are very, very specific, and in less time are they typically background, but they th those do those do happen um, as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in the academic environment, you know, we're working with students on on uh, you know research projects. Obviously, point of care is not as common, right? They're they're not needing something in the moment for a real patient, but uh, you do see a lot of background literature um, requests. Um, uh, one of the examples Annie gave us was, you know, residents who um, have an idea for clinical research that they want to do, or they want to know about a, a trend um, that they're seeing in the in patients, and, and what does the research, the literature say about that? Uh, and that can look, you know, like searching across many different databases, um, uh, sometimes maybe combining, uh, you know, your most highly cited articles. Uh, in the databases with maybe more current research that isn't as highly cited and and sort of forming um, a, a holistic picture of the topic uh, with the student. So maybe a little bit more typical of what you would see, you know, uh, working with um, students in undergrad or in their master's programs on, on research uh, papers or dissertations. Um, and again, comprehensive searching is very common as well, um, you know, looking for a lot of systematic reviews. Um, uh, looking across many different databases. Yeah, great. Um, so I would say, you know, one of the main differences is, is in the clinical informationist work is how we receive the question. So we're receiving the question, we're hearing the question almost at the same time it's being generated by the team. So it's not something that happened and then, you know, two hours later they came back and they called us or they emailed you and, and they relayed the question when they've had more time to think about it. Um, these are, these questions are like being fleshed out kind of live and in person as, um, as I'm hearing them when I'm on rounds. So sometimes they don't even realize it's a question. Like they bring, they bring up a concept and, and then they kind of don't answer the question or don't completely flesh out the thought, and then we'll say, oh, you know, it sounds like that's something that you might need more information on. You know, would it be helpful if we looked up X, Y, and Z for you and provide that information? And overwhelmingly, the answer is almost always yes. <laughs> um, you know, oh, yeah, we did have a question there. So it's live. It's a different way of listening. You really do have to pay attention to the presentations. Um, I, most of the questions that we hear are not directly pointed at us, right? They're, they're more directly po posed to the team. And then the team sort of indicates that, oh yeah, that is something we need to know more about. And sometimes if you're, if you're in a group that's worked with you before, often they'll kind of look at you and say, can you follow up on that question? Um, but there's other times when it's, you know, we really have to sort of insert ourselves, insert and assert ourselves into the discussion um, that a team is having. And so being confident with your skills in searching and your skills to answer those questions is helpful um, mm -hmm. for sure. So the, the typical academic search is, as Amanda, you know, discussed a little bit previously, um, they're less in the moment, right? Someone has had a chance to think about it or, you know, has made a point to get in touch with you, which really has um, 
made it more important for them and get, given them more time to flesh out their question. So that would be the main difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now, you know, kind of getting a glimpse into Jonna's world and, and, and looking at this, uh, you know, we wanted to highlight some definite, uh, there are lots of def differences, obviously, but also highlight some of the similarities with uh, working with any type of patron or in, you know, in, in your typical, like, uh, university or college library. Yeah, so, um, so the first thing that I can say, you know, partnerships are important. So whether you're in academic, you know, undergraduate library or you're in a health sciences library, developing those relationships with your stakeholders is really, really important. Um, the first time we work with a brand new team, you know, we have to establish our usefulness, right? Show them why us being present on rounds is good for them, right? So um, you can explain it to them. You know, we have our little 30-second elevator speech or whatever it is about the work that we're doing, but sometimes they don't quite get it until you answer a question for a particular team and provide them back that, um, you know, uh, what do I want to say, that little kind of piece of information that they didn't know. So typically what happens is the second time we work with teams because um, that's when they're super excited to see us, right? So you've sort of established your purpose, but developing those relationships are great. Our residents and medical students and attendings are constantly rotating on and off teams. The residents are on teams for a whole month. The attendings come in and not out every two weeks. The medical students can do six or eight weeks on a team at a time. Um, so everybody's constantly moving around. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that you run into the same people. Um, it won't be with the exact same group of people, but hey, oh, there's might be this one medical student you've already worked with or this one resident that you've already worked with or that one attending that had a lot of questions that were really helpful. So, um, you know, every person that you work with and that you establish your, your role with is gonna make your life easier the next time you're on rounds with that person. Um, so our patrons, we always have to remember this, our patrons are just people, right? And all of our patrons are medical professionals. So they have some sort of advanced schooling in some area of, of medicine or healthcare. So you just have to remember that, right? Um, you know, there's sometimes I think like people talk about white coat syndrome, right? You go to the doctor and, you know, all of a sudden your blood pressure is higher or whatever that is. Um, if that was the case, my blood pressure would be really high all the time because uh, all I see are doctors all day long. But um, you just have to remember that they're good at what they do and that you're good at what you do. And they're coming to you because they have a question. Like they haven't been able to successfully figure out the answer. So they're already ready to come ask and to help have you assist them. So just kind of remember that um, when, they, when they come to you. Um, so the other thing I would say is that information literacy skills are universal. Like you still have to be able to find the information, evaluate the information, process it, make good, you know, make decisions about it, and then decide if that decision is relevant to the patient that's there in front of you in healthcare or in, in medicine. Um, so all of the things that you teach your undergraduate students, how to find the info, how to evaluate whether it's good, whether it comes from a reasonable source, um, how to process it or synthesize it, all of those skills are transferable. You know, it's not something that we do in health sciences and you don't do in undergrad. Like it happens in all environments. Um, and then you just have to remember that like your skills are, are valuable and time is the biggest issue that our population has. They are trying to do so many things in such a short period of time that anything that you can do to save them a few minutes, they are extremely grateful. So if, if I have more advanced searching skills than a clinician, once they tell me what they need, they don't have the time and they don't want to spend the time doing a fancy PubMed search. It's not to say that they couldn't do that, but they've got other things to do. They have a million things to enter into the electronic medical record and orders to do and patients to see. So you just have to remember that they're good at other things and you're good at the things that, you know, you're good at in the library. So those are all just really important things to remember. So um, 
we had also talked about including this slide about the the information cycle and how um, you know question uh, students um, ask questions they acquire information they appraise it and uh, I think just a helpful thing to remember is that um, you know with with being a, a an informationist or a librarian you know you're really helping um, e even in a medical setting like or clinical setting you know you're helping your patron at the beginning stages of that process or maybe they've come with a question and you're helping them acquire or or refine their question but um, you know it, you're, you're not solely responsible for this entire um, cycle you know that yeah, there's exactly. some responsibility here yeah <laughs> yeah the, the five a's this is a this is a pretty common thing in evidence-based clinical practice sometimes you see this in a circle so it's like an evidence cycle where you see ask, acquire, appraise kind of on a circle. This one is actually fine too. It's nice because you can actually go down and you kind of see how the, how kind of all the, the different A's kind of tailor into each other. So with the chevrons. So typically as a librarian, right, you're involved in the ask and the acquire, sometimes in the appraise um, portion of this, but the apply and the act is actually something that's obviously going to come from your clinicians. Um, but the asking, asking the right question is super important, right? Because if you don't have a refined research question, what do you end up with? Way too many results that are not similar at all um, to the question that you started with. So, you know, asking the right question is super important, and that's where the librarians can really, really get involved um, and, and helping patrons refine their questions whether it's health sciences or any other undergraduate science kind of library situation. So um, we wanted to talk a little bit about how you can apply, you know, um, something like, uh, you know, this learn what you've uh, heard and learned about a clinical environment and, and uh, what your uh, students are eventually going to be doing. Um, to working with your students now you know they're just starting out in uh maybe in an undergrad or you're working with them as you know part of their nursing cohort and uh um one of the biggest things uh that that you can do is try to make your instruction with those students more authentic and you know we we all get asked to come and do uh focus on the, the i've given the student a research project um you know, and I want you to focus on that assignment. Um, and sometimes those assignments are are really great and authentic. You know, it's it's something that the a nursing student is definitely going to have to do in the future. And sometimes they're really not. But um, I think one interesting uh, thing you can do is lean on that faculty member and remind them of you know, hey, what was your clinical experience like? And can we find can I find ways to apply that into um, the instruction that I'm giving your students because I want to I want to make those connections help the, the students make those connections as well as to what they're learning now what they're going to be doing in the future so um, your uh, instructors they may take that for granted that you know if they were clinicians before um, everything that they did in their day-to-day -day, uh, they may not equate that with information literacy but I guarantee you there's a lot there that uh, can be turned into an activity or an, an assignment if they want to choose to do that or even just an anecdote while you're teaching a student how to search PubMed um, you know just like hey you know eventually you're going to be doing this in this capacity and, and you know here's how this helps you prepare for that so that really helps I think uh, you know make that instruction more rich for the students um, the other thing I would say is just remember that you know, your students are, uh, your health science students are at the beginning of a very long journey to becoming clinicians. And you're there to help give them that good foundation, like Jonna said, those universal information literacy skills. Um, so, you know, don't stress that, like, you don't have to teach students every database. Um, you know, maybe just a general awareness of resources that are available to them and really good concrete skills of asking good questions and um, about how to evaluate information. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've heard as well, this, uh, John, this is true in her, her experience as well, is that um, if you're helping instill the idea that uh, the librarian, not just the library resources, but the librarian as a person is a resource, 
that can be um, really helpful too because those students are more, um, quite certainly going to be working in teams in the future in a clinical environment. And, and so, that's part of the that's part of the whole thing. That's the whole reason that we're on the team to begin with, right? We're we're a part of the team as well mm -hmm. as clinical informationists. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say, and you know, this is my own personal anecdote, but I have heard it um, uh, quite often, is that uh, health science instructors are, um, you know, compared to some other the um, disciplines and departments um, seem to be more eager to work with the library. And, and part of it may be because of that team environment that they are used to uh, when they were in, in clinical practice. Um, and now coming back to academia, they crave that. They don't want to be siloed off. Um, there's also just the sheer number of resources that are available um, can be really overwhelming and um, you know, these, these uh, instructors, much like the doctors that Jonna works with, don't have a lot of time to, to manage and teach all of that to students as well. So, you know, if you've got a faculty member who's willing, take advantage of it and, and start uh, collaborating and building a relationship with them, um, whether that's, you know, supporting those research assignments or um, helping them design a research assignment or a lesson that involves information literacy skills. Um, I also see, you know, a lot of course guides out there as well, uh, helping build these um, curated uh, resources for a specific class that just sort of uh, give the students a, a small view of resources that, that um, are related to their assignments that they're doing in that class or um, uh, any concepts that they might be learning. And again, you know, the goal here is, is we focus a lot on outreach to faculty because when the instructor and the faculty see you as um, realize the value that you provide, they transfer that to their student. And it's just preparing them for this, um, you know, eventual day where they're going to have to lean on other resources and, and trust them and collaborate with them as well. Yeah. So in terms of new resources, if, if you're thinking about starting to work with health sciences material if you've not worked with it in the past. Um, the consumer health or the you know, consumer point of care resources are a really great place to start. For, for those that have never looked at it, you know, medlineplus.gov, so that's the kind of consumer health version of, of Medline that's out there. Um, take a look at that. That's a really good thing to take a look at for yourself, but also to point patrons to if they need something that's going to help explain you know, different medical conditions. Um, I would explore what sort of resources you have available through your own institutions or partnering institutions. Um, that's a really great way just to sort of see what you have access to uh, if you've never sort of dipped your toe in the water of health sciences. Um, for any of those that have LibGuides um, at their institutions, you know, you can search the LibGuides community and you can come up with different guides that um, are available. We put the link to one at Drexel University on the slide here about, about different resources and why and when you should use them. But you know, really explore that. This is just one of many links that I could have put on this particular slide. Um, but there's a lot of different, different resources that you can explore um, available for free. If, um, so I would say also if the language of medicine is something that sort of trips you up or you're less familiar with, you know, sign up for a medical terminology class. There's plenty of free online ones. Um, I took one as an undergraduate in college because I needed one extra credit. Little did I know that that was probably one of the most helpful things I was actually going to be using going forward. Um, but I know that uh, one of uh, a practicum student that I worked with a couple of years ago had taken a medical terminology course at a community college. Um, and I use that now for the practicum students that I host currently. Um, so medical terminology is, is always a great way to go. There's always more words you can learn, right? When I used, when I first started um, working, you know, as a health sciences librarian, I basically came out of meetings with lists of words that I had no idea what they meant. So eventually you learn it over time, right? It's like the lingo for anything else. Um, so it's really, that's really a helpful thing if that's something that you um, have the ability to do. And um, 
One additional resource that uh, for helping you, you know, with information literacy concepts in the health science in the health sciences is uh, Credo's newest product, Instruct Health Science. Um, Annie and Jana were both our subject matter experts for creating this product. Um, you you may know uh, Credo for our information literacy and critical thinking Instruct products, or uh, formerly known as the InfoLit modules, uh, which are geared at like undergraduate general education. Um, not really uh, discipline agnostic, as we would say, uh, but this is our first foray into a specific discipline with an aim to support information literacy instruction. So um, this product is a library of tutorials that include, uh, these are online learning objects, that include interactive elements, video, and formative assessments to help students learn different topics related to information literacy in the health sciences. Um, it also has quizzes uh, if you're looking to do some graded assessment. Um, you can mix and match those tutorials based on uh, different classes' needs. Um, you can integrate them with your learning management system to take advantage of uh, gradebook syncing. Um, but we also support IP and proxy authentication if you want to put these materials on your library website or LibGuides. Um, there are also analytics to um, give you usage, but also re assessment reporting. So you can show, you know, not just how much your students are using the product, but also how much they are learning. And um, we primarily see our, uh, the libraries we work with using this product to flip their instruction in order to gain more hands-on time with students um, during their one-shot instruction so that they can focus on those assignments and get hands-on practice with the students. Um, and by flipping that instruction, uh, you can make your uh, instruction a little more effective um, because all of the passive learning that, that you may have done with a, a lecture before, the student's gonna do that on their own time. And you can focus the, the, time, the precious time you do have um, actually applying those principles to the student's assignment or having discussion. And hopefully, you know, students are gonna retain more because they're doing something hands-on. Um, they have more time to absorb those concepts. And you also have a chance to repeat those concepts um, if they, they need it, uh, if they have questions about them. Um, it can also be a remediational tool if you have students who aren't quite getting it and need to do um, run through it multiple times. So these are some of those topics that we're covering in the product, um, you know, different resources like PubMed, CINAHL, uh, point of care resources, drug information, um, health statistics. Uh, we cover the scientific method and health literacy, the PICO method, how to search medical databases, and a very large section on evidence-based practice. So um, there's a, um, quite a few materials in there that I won't necessarily go into, but we have one quick last poll. And if you are interested in learning more about um, health science, um, you know, please let us know. We're happy to reach out to you after. And we're just gonna leave this poll open and uh, move on to some Q&A. We have a few minutes left here. So um, I'm going to take a peek into the Q&A and see what we've got there and uh, serve up some of these questions for, um, for Jonna to answer. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, okay, here's a question for you, Jonna. Um, uh, do you use filtered resources like Dynamed or UpToDate? Um, so the answer is yes, we do. Often, though, I try to. So we have uh, we have up to date only at our institution currently. Um, I have worked places before which have had both. Um, I I typically don't feel like I ever had in the past have needed to teach up to date or Dynamed to students or residents or fellows because they they they're typically got fairly easy to use search engines. <laughs> Um, and they don't take a ton of a ton of uh, into it, more than intuition to search them, but they're both great resources. Um, what we find on cl on clinical, you know, on rounds is that what is, they're coming to us with questions where up to date or Dynamed fail, right? Where up to date doesn't cover that topic. Now, how do we answer the question? Um, up to date has even become sort of a verb at our institution. Well, I up to dated that, and I couldn't find the answer. So now I'm asking you the question, right? So um, yes, up to date and Dynamed, they're great products. Um, if you have access to them, explore them. Um, 
you know, and, and, but usually they have great marketers. They don't need me to explain or to how to show them how to be used. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a, another question here is um, kind of going back to the team. It, is a librarian required in each clinical team or a, a clinical informationist required? Oh, don't I wish that was the case. No, we're, the librarians are not required. Um, we actually have uh, eight or nine clinical teams in our Department of Medicine that are all active on the same day to care for the patients in our hospital. And there's only two of us. So we can only be with two teams at, at max at a time. Um, I do wish we would be required, but that would involve obviously a lot more manpower and we're, we're not there yet. I would love to get to that point. But currently, we're not there. Um, another question is, how often are you not able to answer team questions? Like some of the detailed questions may not have an easy answer or no answer at all. I'm just curious if you get stumped often. Um, so, so the answer is it happens sometimes. There, sometimes it is not an, there just is not an answer to the question or it's not something that has been studied. Um, in that case, we try to find information that is related, so might be related to the, the elements of the question, but maybe not exactly answering the question itself. And we're very straightforward with the teams about that. We'll say, you know, there wasn't a, a good answer that we could find to your specific question. Um, sometimes you find out that the teams are actually asking you that question because they've looked and they haven't found anything and they kind of want you to validate their sanity, like say, oh yeah, they actually want you to not find anything, right? Like we didn't find it and we're really hoping you can't find it either. Um, so yeah, it, it does happen. There are, there are questions out there that are asked and, and usually, particularly when it's a student, that's the point where the attending says, well, you know, that would be a great research project for you. <laughs> <laughs> An untilled field. <laughs> yeah, there's a hole, there's a gap in the literature, go fill it. Go fill it. Uh, another question here is, what databases do you recommend for a school just starting with health sciences majors? Um, so, I, I mean, I would say, you know, start with, you could start with PubMed. That's, that's a great one um, if you, uh, just because it's, you know, freely available. If there's a budget involved, CINAHL. Um, I really like CINAHL. The EBSCO platform is usually familiar um, at undergraduate or community college institutions because there's usually something someone has purchased from EBSCO. So, so something like CINAHL um, is usually kind of an easy add. Um, so CINAHL is, is typically what nursing and allied health, but there's a fair amount of stuff in there. You know, like there's like, I think it's about 70, 75% overlap between Medline and CINAHL. So it's a, it's a pretty good health sciences database. Um, yeah, I, I mean, those would be probably the two that I would recommend. Another, another close favorite would be Scopus, but that's not always health sciences. There's a mm -hmm. lot of health science stuff in there, but not always health sciences. Mm -hmm. um, another question, are you able to map your participation with those clinical teams to patient outcomes? Ah, oh, another great one. Um, so again, we're working on this process. So there has not been a group that has been able to do that and essentially show what I would, what I would say, like reduction in length of stay or something that's measurable or something that's saving a hospital money. There are t there's talk out there of people with some projects that want to see if they could like do a project with a clinical librarian involved on a team and a similar, uh, for a similar patient, like like uh, pair the patients and then have a librarian involved in one and no librarian in the other and see if there's any difference um, and see if they think that difference could be attributed to the presence of a librarian. I would love to work on a project like this. So if there's anybody out there that's interested in doing that, please let me know. Um, <laughs> no, there hasn't been anything formal. You know, we have anecdotal evidence, but we would love to have something formal because the formality or, you know, if you can save a few days of hospitalization by getting to the answer quicker, um, that would certainly be something that the bottom line of the hospital would really be in favor of. Mm -hmm. um, an another question is, um, how do you negotiate your medical content knowledge, knowledge versus the medical professionals you work with? To me, content knowledge is about asking the right questions or being able to search effectively and evaluate search results. Yeah, so I think 
obviously the clinician is going to have way more content knowledge that I am ever going to have. So if so, what I would say is it's important for me when I am asked a question from the clinician. Now, if I've been present for the case presentation, in theory, I should have enough background information about the patient's situation to go and search and come up with a reasonable answer. But if I don't have a piece of information that I need, I have to ask for it. So, so advocating, um, to getting the answer you need, you know, to help you with your with your clinical question. It, that's totally a good reason to ask more questions of the team. There's often times when I have to clarify a question or I have to get more data from the team in order to be able to go back and search effectively. So obviously the clinician is going to be the expert on that patient. I'm only hearing a snippet of a patient's situation on one particular day. So there may be more information that I don't have that I need to go back and obtain. Um, mm -hmm. It's in those situations where I would really love to have um, like read-only access to the electronic medical record. We do not currently have that, but it's something that I would love to um, kind of move forward and try to figure out how we could do that. It's on my list of things to do for maybe mm -hmm. next year. Um, one other question. Do you work with team questions related to behavioral mental health or do those go to a separate department? No. So we so there we answer those questions as well. So there is obviously we have a psych psych department which is separate. It's not under the umbrella of the Department of Medicine. But obviously there's many patients who land as medicine patients that also have psych info or psych psych related issues. Um, so sometimes the behavioral health or the mental health, you know, psychiatry. Um, you know, the, the, ther the therapy folks will come in. So yeah, we, we will answer those types of questions too. Psych med questions are also very popular. And you know, what types of side effects do they have because they can be so varied. We get a lot of um, psych drug questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we answer them too. Right. Um, so I, know, I see we're, we're almost out of time here. I. Um, I saw there was one last question about, um, and maybe we could do this as a follow-up, uh, but just implementing information literacy instruction with students in a PA program on a graduate campus. Uh, we mm -hmm. have several excellent databases, and what suggestions would you give for getting started? Um, so if you have the ability to create a guide or LibGuide or some other guide sort of system for those students, um, if you can meet the students during an orientation period, not like their first week on campus, you know, more like when they first have some of their first assignments. Those are great types of sessions. Um, I think everybody tries to cram library instruction into that maybe like first week that the students show up and that is certainly not the time that they are interested in it um, because they're still trying to figure out, you know, where the bathroom is and where they should park their car if they drove and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, as a PA, yeah, PA, we have a PA program on our campus. We see them probably um, twice early on in their programs and then they're encouraged to meet with us individually um, for consults um, or research projects or anything that they're doing. So I would say a guide um, being, you know, showing your face at some of their kind of meetings or department um, events is also really helpful. Networking is super helpful when you can go to the department events if you ever have that ability. Um, poster sessions or like research, kind of if you have like a research day or anything like that where people from different programs are presenting items, uh, those are always really good things to attend. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, um, I think we've grabbed all the questions, uh, hopefully. Sure. Um, awesome. Great, great. And this is Mark jumping back in here. Um, thank you, Jonna, and thank you so much, Amanda. Um, thanks for spending time with us today and, and sharing all of this, like, really detailed and interesting inf information. I mean, we really appreciate it. Um, I just take a moment to remind folks that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for uh, that follow-up email with a link to the recording. Um, and I would just point out to folks that you should see a link to our brief six question survey in the chat box. If you could take a minute to fill that out to let us know how we did today, we would really appreciate that. Um, and I would just say thanks out, thanks to all of you out there listening in today. Thanks for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed the session and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thanks very much. <laughs>